have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. I need you to pull the plug. Sounds to me like you might need to unplug, man. Oh, you're gonna go unplug? Unplug. Hello, Durham. Uh, welcome again to uh, Durham Unplugged. I'm your host, Sterling Lee. And um, yes, uh, elephant in the room. Uh, there's a bit of a hiatus uh, between episodes. And, and by hiatus, I mean there was a six month break between episodes. <laughs> so I think my last episode was probably in late August. Um, and then after Labor Day, I found things really ramped up. I think things started reopening and work got just really busy again. So I haven't been able to kind of keep up with things. But now that uh, on my side, we've kind of gotten things under control. Um, hopefully you'd have heard a theme song as well. Like I finally added that and ho hopefully a logo. Um, if not, I seem really stupid right now. So we'll edit this out in post. Um, and uh, I have two very special guests today. So this is actually our first time meeting. Uh, my first time meeting these two. We have Curtis Vermont and Patience Adamu, and they are the hosts of the podcast known as The Drip. So Curtis and Patience, welcome on. Thank Thanks you. Coming. Now, um, for those uh, who don't understand uh, what The Drip is, can you guys kind of explain what The Drip is? Patience, you want to go first? Sure. I mean, so we, we started the podcast um, out of COVID, really, uh, just, just wanting to, to find some space to talk about COVID and, and just noticing that the, the way that information was being communicated was um, not, not easily translatable or transferable to certain communities, Black communities in particular. Um, but actually, at that time, it was more diverse millennial communities. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we wanted to, to do something about that. And then, I mean, I think we all know what happened in May of June of last year. What happened? Um, we, we had a, a enormous racial revolution. Oh, that is what you're talking about, yes. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Tenet. Yeah. I thought Tenet was finally released is what you were talking about. You were talking <laughs> something a little more important than that. Very good. Very a little good. bit, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, after that, we, we, we totally kind of, I mean, not totally, but we, we definitely changed our approach, uh, changed our focus and have been really focused on getting people, the, the news that matters to them and um, you know, trying to keep them up to date on, on black issues, uh, North America wide really. So not just limited to Canada, definitely a focus on Ontario, right. but um, you know, cascading that, that information out. Curtis, did I miss anything? Um, I, not that you missed anything. I think that there's, there's, like a, there's two prongs here, right? And I think that what's great about Patience and I is that we both bring uh, two not competing perspectives, but complementary perspectives that's to the table. So there's what Patience just mentioned. Uh, and she kind of did mention this as well, but there's also the, 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 the component of ensuring uh, political literacy, particularly amongst millennials. Um, she did already bring up, the Patience already brought up the fact that we, you know, we're, we're black owned, so we do speak in this language. We do speak to black audiences in particular, but, um, you know, the BIPOC component uh, or the BIPOC demographic is just generally speaking, not spoken to by media. And so we wanted yeah. to do our part to fill that gap. And you guys are doing great. You guys break it down like into like, I think like headlines and the economy. And then there's one subsection called, and I'm quoting now, uh, blackity black, black, black. <laughs> I think that's what the website said. I'm quoting for the record. And um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic podcast. I mean, I, I have a list of podcasts to listen to, and I always try just every once in a while, just uh, tune in because you guys offer very uh, distinct uh, perspectives. Now, I don't know if you guys have covered this. How do you two know each other? So it's funny. We don't. We, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> Curtis, Curtis, um, I mean, we, we have a lot of mutual friends. So right. I think like, I just ended up following Curtis and, and uh, particularly around elections, I found that, that um, Curtis just offered like tons of information in, in a way that was really digestible. So I started following him and um, that, that was kind of one of the ways that, like he was like another CBC for me. Like it was just one of the ways that, that I kind of got my, my, my news. And then I reached out to him after COVID started. I think it was maybe, late March, April, like immediately after COVID started. It was like the, it was the first week that COVID was a, like a thing. Yeah. And, and, and I have, I have always like, not always, but I've been a podcaster for about three, four years now. Um, and I noticed that Curtis wasn't using audio as his platform. Um, so, you know, just reached out and 
it's it's been working. It's 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 amazing how someone who you've never met, how you can have so much like chemistry with them yes. on on air. It's it's wild. Yeah. yeah. The one thing the one thing that she forgot to mention, and I, I just want to plug it in there because the reason why patients reached out to me is because that week, and I, I remember specifically because of what was happening, that was the week where so much information was coming down from the government, from from various sources, and I was doing my very best to put it into my stories for people to understand what was happening. And you know what happened, Sterling? What? 102, so 100, my content was viewed that week 102,000 times. Oh, that's it? Paid advertising. I guess that's okay. <laughs> right? So Says I the should... guy who gets 100 views <laughs> max. <laughs> but please, go on. So it, it's, it's that reason. So I, I, share, I literally shared the data from my Instagram to my stories. And I'm like, hey, look, guys, this is the effect that I'm having. And that's why patients like, Yee! let's have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. And who's, whose idea was the first to like, start? was it patients who just said, let's, let's do a podcast where we kind of go over the, and you guys had the breakdown. Like whose idea was that? So patients reached out to me with the idea, 100%. The reason, but it like, and I think patients can tell you, I think maybe within an hour, I think I was like, yeah, let's do it. Because yeah. and I told her this as well. People had been telling me, like she wasn't the first person to come to me. Like you need to be doing a podcast. So I said, you know what? I'm hearing it enough. This is, this is the greatest time probably to be starting something in this it's true. You know, for this purpose. So let's do it. And, and we haven't looked back since. That is awesome. That is, that's a really cool story. A lot of times just like, oh yeah, you know, we've been best friends forever, but it's kind of fun. You guys barely kind of met each other. And then from there, I think it's about like 42 episodes in. How many episodes do you guys have right now? I th yeah, good. Yeah. So you remember more than, I think we're at 41. <laughs> I checked guys, guys, don't give me too much credit. I, I literally checked right before. I did a little research. Uh, that's all, and that means like what? In 10 weeks, in like two and a half months, it would have been the full year of podcast because you guys do one a week, right? That's yeah. Exactly right. And I mean, like, trust me, like speaking from experience, as you can tell with the six month gap, like I understood, like I was doing two a week and then it dropped to one a week and then one every two weeks. And then all of a sudden it's just like, I got too busy. So the very fact you guys cut out the time and take and use and create the platform, uh, it's, it's awesome because, um, yeah, people need this kind of content, you know, all, all, all the time, all the whole, my whole life growing up. And I'm, I think I'm much older than both of you. You keep hearing that. Oh, we're, I'm, I'm sorry. You don't look it. Yeah, I mean, that's the Asian genes. I'm not going to lie to you. I will look this age until about 50, and then I'll look 90. Like, that's the <laughs> cutoff. And then, like, all of a sudden, I get the hunch. It'll be like my my, my, my father, my grandfather. I, I'm just waiting for that point. Uh, but, yeah, it's baby face until then. But, yeah, like, all, all you keep hearing of just, like, oh, where's the youth? Where's, you know, the BIPOC youth or the... Um, I get uh, racialized or the visible minorities, whatever, we, you know, why are they coming to speak? Why, where's their voice? And it's it's very um, inspiring to see two racialized um, individuals say, you know what, I want to not necessarily be the voice of an entire generation, but just represent, these are some of the thoughts that our generation is thinking, pay attention to it and like, listen to it. And like, it, it's, you guys are pretty, and I think both of you had said you're like politics adjacent. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, Patience, you can go first since I was just talking. Um, yeah, so for, for me, what, what that means is that I am completing my, my dissertation in policy studies at Ryerson University. So I am, I, I can consider myself to be like a, a policy scholar, a, a political scientist. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm going to eventually dabble in, in politics, but I'm definitely um, invested. I'm, I'm like, I think, Curtis, you call them politicos? Is that what you call them? Yeah, political. people who yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm like that. I'm just I'm very very invested in how decision making happens, um, and that's everything from how policies are formulated to how they're implemented to some of the consequences. So like this is this is my scholarship, and right. as a black woman, I mean, th th there's so many ways that that um, that that becomes really complicated. Um, yeah, that, that that becomes really complicated. So. Then that's that's my my relationship to politics. No, that's awesome. And then Curtis, what is your kind of connection to this or and politics? I mean, um, so right now I'm the secretary for the Scarborough North uh, Liberal Association. Okay. Um, and I've been a director for that uh, riding since 2018. Uh, is that federal or provincial? Provincial. Okay. Provincial. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> so I was gonna say, you know, I even without my own ambitions in in running politically. Um, similar to what patients said, I mean, going back 12 years, I've had a very strong interest in policy. 
um, particularly how policy affects people. And, and I'm not just talking about black people, right? I, uh, in fact, I, you know, patients knows this about me. I started off pretty conservative, which means I kind of wasn't thinking about people who look like me, unfortunately. Right. So um, uh, it's about making sure that policy impacts people the best it possibly can. And so I, that's why I wanted to get involved with my, with my PLA. That's why, for example, even right now, the party is undergoing policy, their policy process, and I'm very deep involved in that. Uh, and then, you know, adjacent to that, I'm also on a, a, num a number of boards, as is patients. So, oh. again, looking at the policy perspective, that's, that's just where we play, because we know how important it is. And I guess my next question is, where do you guys find the time to do all this? <laughs> so weekly podcasts, boards, associations, like, again, I, I have a, so my excuse is I have a toddler, you know, he's like three turning four in October. So it's just like, that's, that's kind of kept my hands full as well as like this new counselor job that I've been doing for the past, I guess, almost two and a half years. But like, where do you guys find the time to do all these things? It's a damn good question. Yeah. <laughs> We couldn't tell you. We couldn't tell you. <laughs> like now, mind you, if I really like deep down, like if I deep dive, it's like uh, oh, TV and movies is where I'm watching, using all my time. Really, you know, like I've always just you know. But do you guys, do you guys have find you? Do you guys find especially during COVID, do you guys have time for a social life? Do you guys have time to like do other not kind of like non work related things. I find that I have to force myself to be social, but I, and I, I want to be clear. It's not that I'm so busy that I don't have time to talk to people. It's that I find myself wanting to be busy. And that's, I, I'm speaking for myself. I think that's actually kind of uh, unhealthy to be that way all the time in a pandemic like this, where you, right. you can't be engaging with others. So I'm trying to balance that personally. And for me, it's, it's more, it's less about time, more about energy. I'm surprised that I have, this much energy to, to work, but I don't have that much energy to be very social. Um, no, I mean, again, like there's no, uh, like there's no right or wrong answer at the end of the day. It's whatever works, you know. I always, it, it's the old saying of just, you know, if you love your job, you don't work a day in your life, right? And I, you can tell by the passion the two of you guys have for your respective roles. It's, yeah, it's work, but it's not like, it's not like you're just dreading it and dreading like, oh, here we go again, right? And it, it's, I kind of find that with my job. And I never thought I would get this sort of um, gratification from just being a local or a regional counselor. Like it was just, I fell into this world and here I am and it's been great. And then it is, the, the very nice byproduct is it's not very hard to do because I enjoy it so much. I enjoy kind of deep diving into like, you know, policies and trying to figure out how do I make things better, um, not just in the now, but in the 30 years from now, right? And is kind of humbling that I, I'm, I'm responsible for it. Like, sometimes I wonder of just like, I, I remember how I was at 16 and I'm 39 now. And I'm just like, oh man, like who's letting this kid make these decisions, right? <laughs> Like it's very, it's very hard to grow out of that mentality that oh you're almost like forty and it's and because of that like yeah you you have experience that comes with that too yeah for sure I, I you know I, I want to say because you were saying that you know um, you, I think I heard you say you, you never saw yourself in this position and having impact oh did not no the reason I reached out to you in the first place last summer um, was because I saw you having impact in real time I saw you having impact at uh, at, at, at regional council and you were you were quite frankly standing up for black people and black lives. And, and there was another counselor who was doing it as well. There were two other counselors who were doing it as well, but you stood out to me. So I, I just wanted to thank you for that publicly. Um, you said you, you didn't know what you were here. To, essentially, you didn't know what you were here to do. You didn't know what you would be doing. You did something very, very important, if nothing else. So yeah. And that's uh, it. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, you should know I hate accepting praise and so if i get really embarrassed and I, i'll always try to make some stupid joke because i do not accept compliments um but no I, I appreciate that thank you um but really like for me and this isn't like this is gonna sound like false modesty but just, like i didn't think i was doing anything special at the time like it just seemed very of course this is the way like you know i think you and i touched base after the the town of ajax is you know is the anti-racism task force and really all i said was just like no let's identify the problem which we know what it is it's anti-black racism let's start there and then like yeah as a racialized person i'm gonna get all the benefit from that anyways but to ignore anti-black racism as like the crux of the problem is to ignore the problem and you know i, I i've said this in a few podcasts before but you know i'm 39 I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I honest to God believed that by 2020, racism would be the last thing we talk about now. 
Just like, you know, we'd be talking about like transgendered rights or homosexual rights or anything else. I thought racism would be a thing of the past because we started in the 60s of the civil rights movement. And then what, 60 years later, we're literally having the same conversations. Only things are kind of worse to a degree. And people have really dug in their heels. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I didn't set out to be the, you know, the poster boy for racialized issues. Like, I didn't. Right? It wasn't just like, that wasn't my goal. But I'm just, for me, uh, to kind of what you said, Curtis, if I only have one term, you know, let's say I don't get reelected next term, I can look my kid in the eye and be like, to your point, I made Ajax a little bit better. I made Durham Region a little bit better just by calling this out. And that, like, like I said, it was incredibly fulfilling for me was to get that feedback of people being like, thank you. And it wasn't, I wasn't doing it for thanks. Like I said, it was just a very natural thing for me to do, but it just, it's, I'm still in fear, in a, like I'm pre preaching to the choir ultimately, that we're still having these discussions, yeah. you know, that people still don't understand their own privilege and they're just like, well, what do you want me to do, change? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, you know? And again, like, be, and like people always view change as this horrible thing when it's just like evolution itself is just change. Yeah. And it's exactly. just like, oh, where does it end? I don't know, let's find out, you know? But I just think as a society, we will not let things go to this completely totalitarian state. Like it's just, there's an ebb and flow. There's a natural thing. And just like jump on and be part of that bandwagon and just embrace the change. Right. And that's what it is because, you know, again, I, I used to be conservative and there's different reasons for that. And I don't bring that up lately. I bring it up because I understand the thinking, right? I understand being afraid of change. I understand not understanding things. And as a result, being afraid of it. Right. So oh. it's like, look, if we can what, get, what was what was your turning? Sorry, I, I, sorry to interrupt, but you this no is problem. second or third time you mentioned it. Yeah. What changed for you to go from like even small C conservative to even like small L? Like what was what was your, what was your coming to God moment, so to speak? I, I honest, so there may have been numerous ones, but what I think about whenever somebody asks me this, I always jump to this, and it's the it's the fact that you know I'd say okay, fiscal responsibility, and and you know I grew up Christian, so great, we 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 respect the church and that kind of stuff. And then I would think to myself, so, okay, let's, uh, let's do something to help people who look like me, help the poor. You know, we, I would go to meetings at the, Al the Albany Club, for example, and we would open in prayer talking about doing things for the poor. Okay, well, if we're praying about it, why don't we actually do something? What is the Albany Club, by the way? I don't, the how do I describe it? The Albany Club is, I mean, it's, it's, it is a fortress of conservatism in downtown Toronto. It's where conservatives across the country go to congregate. It's their spot. Is it like the skulls? You, you guys remember that movie in the nineties with uh, Pacey from Dawson's Creek about this like secret society where they like killed people? I mean, no, it's not a good movie. By the way. <laughs> Sorry. Patience, I see your face. Uh, I just remember, yeah, Joshua Jackson was in it, and it's called the skulls. And what you're describing sounds like that, but no, I missed it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 it, look, it's 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 a it's basically a networking forum. And so, oh, hold on, we need to talk about computering, guys. Hold on. So, while well, you're doing that, patience, you and I now. Sorry. Um, what what so you're finishing your dissertation yeah. um what what is the end goal for you you said you might go into politics might not uh as right now on paper like what do you hope to do uh once you're done your education well currently i work full-time on top of being a full-time student um so i i do a lot of, of equity diversity and inclusion work which is really hot right now but yeah. a year ago i was like clamoring for a job yeah. <laughs> but good isn't that it's it's so good to see uh, uh, oh it, it, you about mean, to, it, you're about to talk yourself out of a job. Good. No, no. It, it can it can be good. Like this this explosion of equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives and and positions can be good. But I, I think um, th this is less about programming and more about decision making. So I think what we're going to see in the next year or so is that all of these these companies that are hiring e for for EDI consultants or EDI program managers and EDI you know, chief um, EDI officers, they're going to see that it's, this is really, if you're not committed to doing something about diversity in your organization, top down, it's going to fall flat. Um, so I, I think, I think it's the, 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 the momentum is good, but it's going to take way more than what we're seeing right now. Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like it's, <clears throat> we keep saying you know, in public, oh, let's have the hard conversations. Let's, let's see progress. And then like, I see you roll your eyes. Like the first <laughs> chance a hard conversation happens, people are like, well, I didn't mean that, that no, 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 let's leave. The, and you're just like, no, like let's, 
bring it out in the open. Like, what are our hiring practices? What are our, what are our numbers? Is there an unconscious bias? And how do you address that? Because the fact of the matter is, I find a lot of people look towards black people being like, okay, what's the answer? And a lot of black people are just like, whoa, why are you putting this on us? <laughs> you know, like we can assist and we've already told you stop killing us. That's a really good start. But after that, like, let's work together and try and figure out. But just like, I feel like black people have been telling the world versions of just like, we want this, 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 this. And if we accomplish these, it doesn't put us atop, it puts us equal. We can start from there. And it's just like, we won't, people won't even go there because it gets them uncomfortable. And I'm just like, what do we hope to achieve then, right? Exactly. You know, patients and I, we talk about it almost weekly, or at least for the past little while we have been, this, this concept that, um, and, and I, I say this regularly, this is an indictment on the people who still don't understand but the reality is that there are too many people who still don't understand. And so we have to undergo a massive education regime where we essentially are teaching ourselves to respect ourselves, teaching ourselves to, under, to understand, truly understand, maybe even embrace each other's differences. Uh, and as a result, we can maybe have a little bit more, you know, peace and love on this place called Turtle Island. But we're, we're a long way from there. We're a long way from there. Well, I left it on a bad note, didn't I? Sorry. So yeah, no, I was like, <laughs> this is actually one of the points. This is actually one of the points where I, I, I disagree with Curtis. Oh, here I, we go. Here I, we go. Point, counterpoint. All right. right. Patience, go. Be, be, because I, you, you can see that, all, that I, I have tons of books on the bookshelf behind me. And I. They're just I, decoration, I'm assuming. <laughs> no, these are real books. These are like many of them books written by Black Canadians right. about the black experience in this country. And um, of course there are, there are, there's a surge of books that have been written in, in the last um, year or so. I'm just gonna do a plug for my sis. For Selena, um, is, C3? Yeah, there you go. Um, but before, before Selena wrote her book, Desmond wrote his, before Desmond wrote his, Ronaldo Walcott wrote a book called Black Like Who 20, like five years ago. So I, I understand what Curtis is saying. Yes, education is needed, but what have you been waiting for? Right. Like, I, so it, it makes it, it, it makes me hesitant to say we need to go on an educational campaign. I think what we need to do is force people to make decisions, and 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 that that's me being a little <laughs> that's me being a little you know more aggressive. But you, you need you need to have. Um, you know, some like a, a black board member or a black executive member. You you have to, and then maybe later we'll explain to you why. <laughs> but... <laughs> it, it, no, it's 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 a very no no it's it's very it's very telling that like we're still having the affirmative action argument in today's day and age of just like oh it's always they're always assuming that somehow like they're already approaching their with a bias of just like well what if this person's more qualified and it's just like no no. Affirmative action works like they're both qualified exactly. <laughs> and one is just racialized. Like that's the, you know. But do you, do you see what I mean though? Like, so I, I don't disagree with patients at all because at the end of the day, if education happens, people are going to have to make a decision. All I'm saying is um, it's clear that there are a lot of people who, uh, and, and I, again, I, I kind of, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll defer to patients once again, but there are people who, for one reason or another, they haven't had the opportunity, and I'm being very kind, but they haven't had the opportunity. And look, I, look, because- Do you I'm see Patience's all... face right now, by the way? I know, I This is a video I, podcast. You I get really to see really Patience's face real time. I, I really do get it. What, I, what I'm getting at is that if we can talk about this in the case of racism, we can talk about this in the case of sexism, we can talk about this in the case of religion, right? For, and for example, again, I grew up Christian, uh, I'm kind of going, like, I went through a period where I was very much agnostic. Now I'm kind of like, what is out there? But the point is, um, uh, you know, you could, you could potentially say the same thing about those groups too. Um, I'm just, I'm just trying to be a bit more reasonable, a bit more slow to anger, right? Give more time before, like patients said, we force people to make a decision. It has been a long time. It's been a long time coming and we really shouldn't still be having this conversation, but we are, right? So we have to just see things for what they are now. 
Well, all I see right now is a lot less books behind you, Curtis, versus all the books behind Patience. So I'm clearly going to listen to Patience right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just on volume of books. I think you, wait, you got like a dozen there? I think one of them's a comic book, which no no problem to hear, but I'm just saying. I mean, it's let's let's be real. Curtis is uh, extremely patient. well read, though. He, he is. <laughs> I, I am, but patience is the true academic here, so I, I do concede that absolutely. I, it reminds me of my um, arguments with my sister. Uh, my sister, um, smartest person I know, she just has an aptitude of just like having aptitudes, just like brilliant academic. Put herself through, um, you know, uh, her master's in library science just because she wanted to change her careers in her mid to late 20s. It was fascinating. But something I'm better at, I feel, and I'm hoping she never sees this so I don't hear about this in the next family outing, is just like, I'm better, like, there is the intellectual side and the academic side, but there's also um, the uh, being able to get that point out there in a digestible manner. So patients you are saying, why don't people, you know, the history's there. People are too lazy to read books in general, like myself included. Like I was an English major. I read more books and then being an English major taught me to hate reading for a while because it, it kind of ruined the, the joy I used to have of opening a book and just enjoying the book. Everything became um, analysis and breaking it down. And that kind of took me out of just enjoying books. But it, your point is absolutely valid of just like, this isn't a new topic. It's been written about like, like I said, from the 60s and even beyond then to 2020, it's like 60 years of information. If you wanted to look, you could look. So stop acting like you just want to look. Um, wow, this is this is a very, this is, our, my, my, this is not normally this heavy, my podcast, by the way. So let's, let's line it up a bit. Just um, yeah, we'll have to stick on this for sure. <laughs> yeah. During, during COVID, um, what did you guys find yourselves doing um, to decompress? Uh, early on, I guess, obviously, you guys are kind of back to the swing of things, but, like, did, what, what did you watch? Did you watch Tiger King? Did you watch, like, what, what did you guys do? <laughs> I watched everything, man. It was the worst, right? We can agree on that. What's that? Tiger King was garbage. Like, let's just be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think I watched it towards the end, but I couldn't finish it, and I was watching it to understand what others were. Yeah, here. that's how I, that's what, that, I did that with The Queen's Gambit. Everyone was talking about The Queen's Gambit and how it was so good, and then I was just like, yeah, that was okay. Like, I, I think it was overhyped. I think people have a tendency to overhype certain shows. I haven't watched it yet. No, oh, of course not. You're too busy. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's a fun thing I, I should know about each of you? So, like, all, all the um, advocacy and academics, that's great. Like, that's, that's a big part of who you guys are. But, Patience, tell me something fun about yourself. Um... You really think very you know what I find? This is the worst question. This is what I, I know. Worst. You guys are ready for the deep stuff. <laughs> this is this uh, easy breezy stuff. Patience, come on. What's what's an embarrassing fact about you? Uh embarrassing. Um, sorry. I um. Uh, how about this? Uh, what's your? What's I don't know how to. I don't know how to ride a bike properly. Hey, neither do I. Yeah, it's really like I, I I can stay on it for a little bit. It's it's just sad though. It's really I, I've sad. never tried. I always tell people I think I understand the mechanics of it, and if I tried now, it would be fine. But there's so much like I'm 39. There's been so much buildup of like, oh, when are you gonna ride the bike? When are you gonna ride a bike? That it's like I don't even want to now because the expectations are way too high. You can't learn as an adult. I think you can't Thank learn you. how to ride a bike as an adult. Thank you have you. to do it as a kid. The problem is like Ajax is like one of like the big, like we have a huge biking subculture. And there's this one guy on the internet on Twitter, Joe Aruda, he works at the region and he just constantly chirps at me. He like, he like tags me and like bike manufacturers. And they're like, hey, can you help out regional counselor? Lee? And I'm like, come on, man. Why are you gonna call me on the internet like that? Um, but yeah, okay, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I'm glad I share that with someone in, in our adulthood. Uh, Curtis, how about you? An embarrassing fact about myself. Or a fun cool. fact. A fun or embarrassing, okay, fun fact. Like there's, there, honestly, I'm trying to find something worth talking about, like. Everything's worth talking about. I, I, okay, I, 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 I love the outdoors, um, you know, so you might think of me as somebody who just reads and sits at a computer. I, I love talking to people, I love being outdoors. Um, I'm a big camping person, um, whitewater rapping, I love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. All the black stereotypes in my, you're lying my, to me right now. What do you mean? Right White water rat? What is that? A knife? That, that's my camping knife right here. Literally, I keep it right here. That uh, is awesome. And how did you get into this? Was this something your parents uh, brought you into, or is this something you kind of picked up as an adult? Um, so I was forced into the Royal Canadian Air Cadets as a youth. Oh, uh, you you went tagging. I, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, amongst plenty of other things. But yeah, I was, I was, uh, I learned to love the program, and that's where I learned all these skills: survival training, leadership training, uh, the love for the military. Quite frankly, all that kind of stuff. I always criticize the air cadets because, like, yeah, tagging. They just they stand outside like a love loss, and they sell yeah. these little tags, right? And they're just like, here, buy it. And and I'm always like, couldn't you give me something? I could use again, like a mint or a chocolate or something. Like, what was, what do you know? And why, why, why these tags? Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very, it's, I'm, I'm actually kind of happy you're bringing it up. Not that I care, but hopefully cadets will listen to this and be like, he's supporting us. Um, <laughs> Is that how cadets sound, by the way? <laughs> Just making sure. They are between the ages of 12 and 19, so. Fair enough. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's these little pieces of paper and basically it's really cheap, right? But the point is to get that donation because the system, apart from government funding, it completely runs on donations. Right. So if you were to spend money getting candies or stuff like that, I mean, that takes away from the profit you're supposed to be using to run the program. And it is a really good program. Um, so that's why that happens. No one likes tagging. No one likes tagging whatsoever. So if you as like the public doesn't like being asked, we don't like asking or right. they don't like asking, I should say, but it, it's one of those things that the program needs. And it's, it's a weird life skill that, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, you guys have been, uh, like you said, politic adjacent, like uh, people always, I always like connected to canvassing where like, ultimately at the end of the day, do I love canvassing? No, there's many things I'd rather do than like knock on doors eight hours a day times however many days of the campaign. So like 40 to 60, like that's your life of just knocking on doors and it's tiring. But if those who are good at it, figure out a system and like, it is just like, like, you know, I, 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 brought it down to sales of just like either I'm selling you on me as the candidate or you're selling me on why you don't have time to talk to me, but someone's winning that sale. And I was just like, okay, well, I, I think I'm a pretty good salesperson. And it started becoming this like weird competitive challenge for me where, you know, and it is it. And I think the most success, successful politicians are the ones who are good at uh, talking to people sight unseen. Right. And that's ultimately what tagging is. It's just like, can I sell you this? piece of paper right <laughs> so it teaches it teaches you kind of be bold and these are like these are skills they don't teach in school at the end of the day right of how to sell people or like financial literacy and i know you guys covered the gamestop stuff and it's just like i'm 39 i just started my own tfsa like invest investment account before my tfsa more like wow yeah it, i was making two percent like on my tfsa and i was just like clearly there must like this is back in october and i was like there must be a better way to do this, yeah. right? And so I, I was on Wall Street bets like probably in October and I got some like uh, green stocks and I've been doing much better than I was previously. But it took me this late in life before I realized that, right? And I just like, I think Mitzi Hunter had, had a bill, previous government of oh. teaching financial literacy to yep. kids. And I, it's, it's such an important task that no one's talking about right now. Yeah. We need more of it. And um, I mean, look, it, it's it's financial literacy, not only for youth, <laughs> but for all demographics. Um, you know, as a result, I, I guess I'm getting back to the black issues here. I'm going to- I'm No, it's fine. No, no, Curtis, please. But because of George Floyd's murder, I also launched a social enterprise called Here to Uplift Black Men. And one of the things that I was going to focus, or that I am going to be focusing on, is financial literacy. And it's, it's for everyone, because we yeah. all need it. Seriously. Yeah. Um, and it's it isn't, sorry, I just no, want to say, it isn't it isn't a it isn't a black thing no, that much. Right. It's a class thing. It's it's also a bit of an immigrant thing. Yep. Um, because when you enter into this part of the world, that there's, there's just there's no orientation really on how to acclimate yourself from you know into these systems and the and the way that things work. No one really is gonna help you. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's 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 way 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 overdue in terms of. Um, yeah. And especially like your generation too, right? Like million dollar houses in Durham region seem to be the minimum now. And it's just like, yeah. the one thing I kick myself of just like, why didn't you buy a house or invest in a house earlier when things were so much cheaper? But again, like try telling a 21 year old to buy a house. Like that's just crazy. I'm going to enjoy my life. But now it's just like my wife and I are still renting and we're like priced out of the market. It's crazy that we're, we're in a weird real estate market where like no conditions is the minimum. That's where you're starting from. If you have a single condition, get the hell out of here. Like, I don't even want to talk to you. No and that's, to that's asinine. Like people are just bidding sight unseen on things. And like, oh my God. And like, it's going to get worse. Like this bubble 
which people were talking about when I was in my 20s, so like 20 years ago, it hasn't burst yet. In fact, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And you're almost like, oh, is this like too big to fail then? Like, and that's, that must be so intimidating for like uh, people of your generation to know that, oh, you may never buy a house, even though that was something your parents did, your grandparents, like just who's going to start off with a six figure job right out of school, have all their debts paid and then able to start a down payment. It's just, it's so frustrating. And, and look, it's, you know, what you described is the reality for many. There are also those who do come out of school doing very well and they're able to buy property. I mean, I, to put into perspective, uh, one of my good friends who I used to work security with, he's now a senior vice, not a senior, he's now a vice president at TD Bank, right? Same age, right? So it is possible to make it. And he, uh, he's, he's, he's of Arab descent. We, we know we're from Malvern. We, 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 uh, from the hood, but, um, uh, Sorry, I forgot what I was going where I was going with that. The point I'm making is you just want to humble brag for your friend. I mean, I guess I could. Was, <laughs> you might as well give his name at this point. Give him a full shout out. No, but where I was going with that is um, is uh, is uh, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. No, I think I know what he was going. So sometimes me and Curtis are on the same wavelength. You do that a lot. I think, yes. I think I think where Curtis was going is that what, what, what we're seeing the eradication of the middle class, and we're seeing lots of people get get way richer, lots of people get get way poorer. Yeah. Um, I think that the impacts of this on the millennial generation is like there are so many jokes about it now that it's 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 almost funny maybe that people are, are saying that that we're never going to move out of our parents' homes and that we're we're always going to. Um, like we're never going to 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 have kids. Like 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 we're we're trapped in this kind of um, system. Purgatory. Pardon? Purgatory. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're, we're trapped in a, in a purgatory. After that, that's a that's an excellent um, kind of analogy for it. So yeah, it's. I mean, I, I was I was pretty fortunate um, for to to have a little bit of insight. So I, I do own my home in Oshawa. Um, I bought it five years ago. This interview's five over, by years the way. Get ago. out of here. This interview's over. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was five years ago, and everybody told me, honestly, Sterling, everybody told me I was crazy. What are you doing? How can you move from Toronto to, like, Oshawa in the middle of, like, nowhere? Why right. are you doing this? And I, I had a feeling. I was like, this is going to get bad. <laughs> this is going to And it only took five years bad. or, like, six years. And look how bad it's gotten now. It's like it's you know? really yeah. So, um, but 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 absolutely, it's it's out of control, and um, people don't people people can't do it. Not that they, they don't think they can do it. People can't do it. You can't make sixty k, seventy k. What was normally no what what is no? It's not normal anymore. It you can't you I, I we can't consider sixty k or seventy k a middle class income if it can no longer afford you a home, yep. even if there's two of you making that in a household. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And so that that's not middle class anymore. We have to like some adjustment needs to be made in order to to give people to afford people the the, the lives that that they need to have or that they should have. And it's a really good observation of just like the class structure is something people aren't looking at too much. Like it's easy racism and transgender. These are the kind of the the flashy things but there's this there is this inherent class structure right now where it's just like i remember the ontario liberals were like we're gonna raise minimum wage to 15 dollars and first we're gonna go 14 dollars and then next year we're gonna go 15 and i remember everyone was just predicting the collapse of the modern economy if that happened oh my god my small business will never survive and like i always just i love going back because it was only like four or five years ago that happened. Yeah. It went to $14 an hour. I think it went that far and then it stopped. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, I don't think businesses collapsed because of that. Yes, because of COVID, that was, that's the X factor you couldn't predict. But like, we have this desire to, to pull people down, be like, well, if they're making that much, then, you know, like, I should be, and you're just like, why can't you just create a minimum wage? Right. <laughs> How does that affect you? You right. know? Or, or, oh, sorry, just very quickly, just like we're, we're, we keep saying, oh, my God, front, frontline workers, let's drive our cars and clap our hands. Thank you so much. But we won't give you an extra buck. Like exactly. that, that is what that is what kills me. And it's this weird class structure we're in where we want everything to be harder for subsequent generations irrationally. Irrationally. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, look, life is hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. But where we have clearly made life better. Why don't we ensure that we can share some of that improvement for all? And look, there's plenty of improvement to go around. So why don't we share some of that? It's not, it's, it's not rocket science.
on our podcast, we've spoken about um, universal basic income. We've spoken yep. about living wage. Um, and neither of those things are $15 minimum wage. Like yeah. we're, we're at the beginning of the conversation yeah. and, and we, we still have a, a long way to go before, you know, we, we, we have a, a more equitable society. Or it's like the craziest for me is just when people like defend large corporations. <laughs> Like they're in somehow need of defense. Like, oh, what about Amazon? I remember like uh, the key thing was just like the food delivery services, you know, like um, we're trying to cap their just their their percentage, their cut, so to speak, for being the middleman. And we were like, oh, my God, it's going to ruin the food delivery industry. And it's just like, why are you defending Uber Eats? Why are you defending uh, Skip the Dishes? <laughs> like, yes, it's made your life easier. I get that. But like if you don't see the harm they're doing and this company, they will survive no matter what happens, we're just saying they don't have to be this greedy. Yeah. You know, I, I'm in a capitalist world. I accept I'm in a capitalist world. There are certain rules we have to follow, but it shouldn't just be like you stab everyone along the way to grow to where you are. Yeah. And uh, Amazon's the worst culprit of that. I use Amazon, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot in the, during COVID. I mean, who doesn't? But at the end of the day, they don't need me to defend them. In fact, they have hundreds if not thousands of high-priced lawyers who can defend them if need be so why don't we just call them out for what they are and hopefully they'll change within like that's like the minimum we should be doing that's what it is and then just to kind of come full circle that's what i meant about the education piece because there's people who will kind of viscerally that you'll hear for example well let's pay people more well what about those businesses that might get lot? And they 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 for some reason it's, it's not clear to me tie themselves to that entity as if they're one and the same. Um, so why, <laughs> let's just cut that. You're, you're not the same. Let's just cut that. Yeah. Well, you guys have been incredibly generous with your time. I, I could be speaking with you guys for, for hours, but uh, it is also a Friday evening right now, and you guys probably have, I'm guessing, more work to do <laughs> as I go upstairs and watch TV. Um, but just quickly, um, is there a, a, a patient, is there a small business or a restaurant you, you'd like to plug? There's a there's a, a local nonprofit that I'd like to plug in. Please, Ottawa. Cornerstones does amazing work. So they're they're, they're a shelter. Uh, they also just provide other kind of local services. I, I don't have to tell folks on the line or folks who are listening that Oshawa, um, you know, is, is kind of struggles with with a, a number of things. Um, but uh, Cornerstones has done a really good job of making sure that their doors are always open, that folks who are struggling, whether it be with substance abuse or with domestic violence, have somewhere to go. Uh, I've been trying to support them every single winter because winters are, are really rough. Right. Um, so, yeah, Cornerstones in Oshawa. And you've been helping them out since you kind of got to Oshawa? Or? Since I got to Oshawa. So it's been five years. Usually in the holiday, like the two weeks uh, adjacent to um, Christmas, I'll drop off toothbrushes, toothpaste, just like like stuff that, that people can use to, you know, the hyge like a hygienic little um, kit. Yeah, yeah. that's super cool. Curtis, how about you? Um, I got two because one is, you know, good for the community. One's good for my stomach. Um, the one good for the community is Taibu, um, which is a community health center based in Malvern, but it also um, serves the entire GTA, including Durham. Uh, uh, can you spell that? T-A-I-B-O-O? -O? Uh, no, T-A-I-B-U. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I went there, actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes. Okay, go on. Great place for community health care for those uh, who are of African descent, of, of Caribbean descent. And, and if you need some, if you're in the community and you need support, you can go there too if you're not of that descent. Let's, let's be clear about that. Um, so that's one because they do very good work supporting the health of people who obviously need it. And second of all, uh, I'd like to shout out Starburger down the street from me in Whippy because they are tasty as hell and they are a Durham institution. Thank you, you for all your tasty food. Is that your favorite burger? Because this is one of those debates it that I will argue with. Like, it if you ask me, and I know they're a chain, I think the best burger is Five Guys still. Like, consistently, like they, I get the best burger from Five Guys. And it's still, you know, like a you know, business hiring people. But I know they're a larger chain. And it's it's more, like, sexy to say that, oh, this this dive in the, in the walls is the best burger. But I, I have yet to eat, like, a, a good, uh, consistent burger better than Five Guys. I, I, so I can't speak to that. And I can't speak to uh, Starburger being the best, but they are way up there, just like Star uh, just like Five Guys, for sure. Patience, what's your best favorite burger? Burger King? <laughs> <laughs> They're royalty. They're royalty. royalty. How do you argue with royalty, right? Royalty. 
Um, so thank you so much. Uh, how can people reach you on social media? Uh, Curtis, I'm, why don't you start? I'm at State of Vermont on Instagram or Curtis Vermont basically everywhere. And, uh, just... and I am Patience Eve uh, everywhere. Um, and we are The Drip yes. T.O. On, on Instagram. The Drip T.O.? Yeah. You couldn't get The Drip? Um, I guess not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the drip is available and you guys just chose not to get it. <laughs> or, or, or the drip podcast, so that's why. Well, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Again, the drip is a fantastic um, uh, podcast hosted by these two. They go over real life issues. It, they approach it, I'm going to say, from a younger uh, lens, which is incredibly important for our generation that listens to podcasts. I say our generation because I'm being generous, but I'm probably close to twice your age, respective ages. But anyways, um, <laughs> you can you can find me. <laughs> how, how old are you guys? How old are you? You guys are like children. How old are you guys? We're thirty. We're thirty. I'm still like a decade older than you. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, when uh, yeah. <laughs> It's so true. I always think I'm so much older sometimes. It's the job. I'm, and I also act like a child. So it's that dichotomy. Anyways, you can find me at uh, your voice for Ajax. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment uh, on the podcast. Um, thank you both of you. I'll say goodbye to you right after. Uh, and thank you for uh, watching. Like I said, I'm glad to be back. Hopefully, we'll see a more consistent stream of um, episodes coming out. Uh, hopefully, a weekly schedule like the drip. Um, but I, there's only one of me and there's two of them and clearly they're harder working than I am, but it's an absolute pleasure to have you both. Hopefully we'll have you on again sometime down the line and we'll have uh, these, these conversations will continue. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. And, um, I forgot how I sign off to be honest. We'll see you next time on Turtle <laughs> Unplugged. <laughs>